Hi, uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, wherever you're watching us from. Uh, I'm your host today, uh, Sari Satyogi from WHO Department of Communication. Uh, today we are back with WHO live Q&A with our expert. Uh, tell us where you're watching us from today. And um, last week, um, WHO together with UNICEF, uh, UNESCO, a special representative of the UN Secretary General on Violence Against Children and uh, the End Violence Partnership, um, we have released the first of its kind global status report on preventing violence against children. So today we are here uh, to unpack this very important topic with a WHO expert, Alex Butchard, uh, who is WHO Head of Prevention, uh, Violence Prevention. Uh, hey, Alex, how are you? Hi, sorry, I'm good, thanks. And it's great that you're hosting this topic on a very important subject. And greetings to everyone, wherever they may be. Indeed. Um, and uh, we are also going to take your questions later on. Um, so please post them as comments uh, and we'll try to answer them uh, as we uh, talk. Um, so Alex, maybe you can um, tell us uh, how many children are actually affected by violence every year? Thanks, sorry. Um... The best estimate we have is that around 1 billion children or every other child is affected by some kind of violence each year. So it's a very substantial number of kids that are that suffer violence. We should bear in mind, however, that not every one of those children who are exposed to violence will go on to have equally severe consequences. But the figure that all the age agencies are using is one billion children or every second child. That's a lot. That's uh, half of the, the world's children, right? That's half of the world's children. And um, I think when this work started to really take off and more and more countries did surveys to understand through self-report from children and from young adults about their experience of violence as children, we were all initially quite surprised that you would find 50-60% in some countries of kids reporting physical abuse, uh, very high percentages like 20-30% of children reporting sexual abuse, and then you add in bullying and other forms of violence and you very rapidly reach this enormous total. But we're confident that the number is is a reasonable and probably, in fact, an underestimate, given that more and more representative population surveys are showing around that proportion of children to experience violence year on year. Right. It's it's really shocking, the number. Um, can you uh, give us some examples of the types of uh, uh, violence that are experienced by children? Um, you mentioned sexual earlier, uh, but what what are actually the violence that are faced by, by children? Sure, we, we understand the types of violence that children suffer in a life course mm -hmm. approach. So we look at child maltreatment, which typically occurs or starts to occur among very among infants and very young children, but can of course continue up until the age of 18. This is typically at the hands of parents or other caregivers. Then as children get, get a bit older, you add into the mix peer violence. For instance, children that are bullied at school by people in their classrooms, or people that are bullied or subject to violence by their acquaintances in the community. In adolescence, then we start to add in a further type of violence, which is um, an early form of intimate partner violence or dating violence, which typically occurs among older adults and younger adults, in fact, who are experimenting with intimate partner relationships. And then a final type of violence that occurs in late adolescence and spills over into younger adulthood is youth violence, which can be quite severe, may often involve guns, drugs, 
and guns, sorry, uh, guns, drugs, and alcohol, and can lead to quite severe injuries. Of course, all the other forms of violence have got many, many consequences which stretch across the life course, but we could tackle that in a different question. Mm -hmm. um, how about uh, violence, say, from uh, teachers at school, like some kind of punishment? Is that counted as well? Absolutely. We, we include violence within institutional settings such as schools, orphanages, and detention centers, typically in the form of corporal punishment, because that clearly has been shown not to have any great value as a means of instilling self-control and discipline on the part of children. In fact, it has the opposite effects. It leads to kids becoming more used to and more normalizing of violence. So we really work hard with many partners to promote alternative approaches to discipline that do not involve corporal punishment. And there are some very effective programs that have been trialed and tested in various parts of the world to show that school teachers, school administrators, and teachers in the classroom can very well do work and instill discipline without any recourse to corporal punishment at all. Hmm. Uh, thanks, uh, Alex. And for those who just join us uh, today, we are talking about uh, violence against children. Uh, the next question, Alex, is uh, what are actually the impacts of uh, violence in uh, a child's life in terms of short term and long term? Thanks. In the, in the short term, the most obvious impacts are injuries physical injuries like broken bones or brain damage or uh, dislocated dislocation in the eye, bruising and so forth. In extreme cases, this can, learn, this can lead to death. But in fact, of all those 1 billion children that suffer violence each year, there are only, a, a, we estimate, around 40,000 that result in death or homicide. A far, far larger proportion of children, however, go on suffer neurological and mental health and psychosocial problems, which then later, as they grow older, emerge in the form of unsafe sexual behaviors, such as multiple sexual partners, excessive or smoking, drinking, drug taking, problems with uh, eating too much or eating too little, problems with not doing enough physical activity, and issues around suicidality, as well as passing on and becoming more violent themselves towards their peers and their intimate partners. So it's really when you, look, when you start to look at these longer term consequences, in addition to the immediate consequences, that the effects of violence against children mount up. Because if you think about it, smoking, drug use, excessive alcohol use and unsafe sex are some of the big risk factors for some of the major non-communicable diseases in the world today, as well as for very key uh, dis uh, communicable diseases such as HIV AIDS. So the consequences are really quite staggering when you unpack them. It's, it's really broad, Alex, yeah. Um, we started getting questions from our uh, audience here uh, related to what you just said. Specifically for um, domestic violence, how does that affect children? Um, very often children that are witness to domestic violence, for instance, between their mother and their father or other adults in the home, will suffer consequences in terms of um, feeling fearful of feeling fearful of the adults, not trusting the adults. And indeed, witnessing intimate partner violence can lead to some of the same consequences as directly experiencing such violence. And importantly, witnessing domestic violence leads children to think it's a normal and okay, well, maybe not an okay thing to do, but the way that you do things when you resolve conflicts in a family setting. And children that have been witness to intimate partner violence are themselves more likely to use it or to suffer it when they grow up to be adults. 
Thanks, uh, Alex. Uh, one question also now uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, with measures such as staying home and school closures, does it have any impact uh, towards the, the uh, problem of violence against children? <clears throat> yeah, we, we looked into this specifically for the report, although I should, should say that most of the report uh, was prepared prior to the pandemic. However, we, we did a, a rapid scan of what literature we could find, and we found quite a number of newspaper reports providing anecdotal evidence for spikes in calls to child helplines about and from children in families where there was a problem of child maltreatment occurring. At the same time, in several countries, there were also reports of quite steep decreases in access to child protection services, suggesting that as the problem increased within the family setting, due to, as you said, stay-at-home measures and closure of schools, so people were less able to access the kind of services they would have needed to in order to escape from these abusive situations. So it really was, a, it, it is a, a very complex situation and a challenging one. We of course await more rigorous research to validate these findings, but there seems to be quite enough anecdotal newspaper reports from different parts of the world to suggest that this is very likely to have been the case. Yeah, it's very, it's very concerning. Um, we are getting a lot of questions around prevention, uh, whether this, uh, all this violence that we're talking about, are they actually preventable? And what kind of sign that, that one can see? And uh, Let's start with that. Great. I mean, this, of course, is the, is the, the billion person question. Uh, and I think it's very exciting to know that most forms of violence against children have been shown to be preventable through carefully evaluated programs that work with individuals, with the family, at the community level, and at the societal level. WHO and its partners have put together a technical package for prevention, which we call INSPIRE. And each letter of the word INSPIRE stands for one of seven prevention strategies. I stands for implementation and enforcement of laws. For instance, laws to reduce access to alcohol and misuse of alcohol, both by children and by parents, which have been shown to substantially reduce alcohol-related injuries and homicide um, among older adolescents. Then the, the N stands for norms and values change. And in several studies in Africa have revealed that Community mobilization programs aimed at sensitizing parents and children and uh, to norms that do not condone violence and promote pro-social behavior can substantially reduce, in particular, intimate partner violence, and with that, the likelihood that children will witness it. S stands for safe environments, where we focus upon modifying the physical environment through which people move um, and this has been shown through several studies, once again, including in Africa and other developing countries, to reduce the prevalence of um, violence-related injuries, in particular those related to alcohol use. P stands for parent and caregiver support, and there's rapidly growing evidence to, to show that both center-based parenting support programs and home visiting programs can help parents to develop skills that will allow them to avoid maltreating their children or neglecting them. The second I stands for income and economic strengthening, which once again has been shown in several developing countries to help reduce the risk of child maltreatment and other forms of violence in the family. R is the, is the one responsive um, strategy. It stands for um, uh, response services for victims of violence. And there, there's also good evidence that for instance, programs which provide cognitive behavior therapy with a trauma focus can help to reduce the behavioral and emotional effects of children exposed to violence. 
And then the last one is education and life skills. There's a strong body of evidence which shows that keeping kids in high quality education in itself is protective against violence. And then within schools, providing education and life skills training or providing life skills training to children has been shown to substantially reduce youth violence and subsequent violence within the family and the community. So there's really quite a good amount of evidence and it's growing every day for preventability. That's, uh, that's good to know, Alex. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, for those who just joined us today, uh, we're talking about uh, violence against children, uh, a very important topic. Um, and uh, if you have any related questions, uh, please uh, uh, type that down as a comment uh, on uh, Facebook and we will try to address them. Um, so, Alex, uh, we received a question uh, from uh, Claudia uh, Munoz Rocha. Um, what can regular citizens do to reduce and prevent violence against children? You, you mentioned about what governments do. So, now what uh, people can do? Normal people. Can do. Yeah. I think, I think regular citizens have a lot to contribute to prevent violence against children. For one, they can all promote norms that, um, that advance non-violent approaches to raising of children and to the resolution of conflict. They can point to examples of families and societies where this is a normal thing and that can help to denormalize it. There's also a huge role that we can play as bystanders. For instance, we may we may be in a situation where we, we witness something about to happen, where a child may be subject to violence, and it may be that we can intervene to prevent that from happening. And indeed, this is one of the focus of bystander programs that are being developed in, in several countries, especially for older violent, uh, violence among older adolescents, but one can also imagine bystander interventions working for violence towards younger children. I think we can also keep an eye on ourselves. We need to reflect upon our own tendencies to lash out, be it verbally or physically, and maybe stand back, count to 10, and say, "Do I? am I going to do that? Why would I do that? I won't do that. And in fact, WHO has, with partners, developed a set of parenting tip leaflets. I think we have um, 12 tips in the set which are focused upon giving all of us very practical behavioral tools to avoid lashing out when things become too much and we may lose it, as it were, and then um, kind of act violently towards our kids. And those parenting tip sheets are available on the WHO COVID-19 site in the health, under healthy parenting. And I think if you type in WHO healthy parenting, you get immediate access to those tips. As I say, they're for all of us, and I think they're available in around 50 or 60 different languages. That's great, and I think uh, that kind of tips could be very helpful for parents, uh, especially when uh, uh, some of them now have to spend more time with their children at home because the children are not going to school. Um, a question, uh, another question from Molao Betuel. How can we help those who keep quiet about uh, those who, who, who abuse them? This is uh, a, a hugely important question and a difficult one to answer. Most victims of abuse, when it occurs within the family setting, where they are suffering violence from people very close to them, such as their parents or their intimate partners, are not disclosing this to anyone. Therefore, I think we need to focus upon the role of people such as, or, or professionals such as teachers, doctors, nurses, and social workers who may be able to identify the signs that somebody is suffering such abuse and we need to help those professionals to find a way of broaching the topic with that individual to try and reach out to them in a way that will ensure their safety, but will also 
create a bridge of trust so that that individual can start to disclose the fact that they may be suffering violence and through that be provided access to appropriate help. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, another question from Serena Chern. Um, she asked, how can we help children who have gone through violence or traumatic experience at home or school? So um, there are several um, interventions that have proven valuable for children that have suffered violence, one of which I mentioned earlier, and um, it's called trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. And this has proven quite effective in helping children to overcome the um, emotional and mental consequences of abuse. Um, and it's an important intervention also because in um, parts of the world with low resources, they've shown it possible to deliver this intervention through trained lay workers who are carefully supervised by a professional psychologist. Of course, in extreme cases, there may be levels of psychological and um, psychiatric um, distress that require more involved assistance, for instance, on the part of professional psychiatrists. Um, but for the most part, children are likely to benefit from cognitive behavior therapy where it's available. An important other category of, of people who, who can benefit from this are perpetrators of violence against children. For instance, young, inexperienced parents who may be violent or maltreat their kids, not out of spite or malice, but because they don't know better. There, various forms of family therapy have been shown to be effective. And then for adolescent um, aggressive offenders, there are various cognit cognitive behavior approaches that have been proven quite effective in reducing the continuation of violence on their part. Thanks, um, thanks Alex. A follow-up question uh, from Serena as well. As an individual, what should we do if we notice uh, violence against children in, in our community? How to help without making things worse? How to help without making things worse is, is the big question. I think the first thing we have to do is to ensure that whatever steps we do take are not going to jeopardize the child, the family in any way. Of course, we have to make an assessment of seriousness. If to our mind, something terrible is going to happen, for instance, there's going to be a murder or a serious physical injury event, we need to take immediate steps and call the authorities the police or other, if they have them, specialist child protection units. If there are instances where there seems to be a more chronic situation of low-level maltreatment and neglect, it may be that this is symptomatic of some other underlying problems within that family. For instance, mental health problems and alcohol or drug abuse problems on the part of the parents. And there we would if we are able to make the judgment as individuals, hope that people could be more, uh, how can I say, strategic in connecting that family to some kind of social work help or maybe opening up the family to talking about it and then bringing them into touch with, with social workers who are professionally trained to assist the family navigate and overcome these, these background problems, which then would be the things that are driving that kind of maltreatment. However, it's a really tricky area for any individual to, to tackle. And um, I don't think we have a simple recipe for, for, for how to do it. Mm -hmm. We need to, to understand the situation better before just, uh, jumping in to, to, to help. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, in relation, you mentioned about ch uh, child protection services. We get a question from Fatima Tabur. Um, she asks, what about countries where there is no such services? What um, help is available? Right. Many countries have got either no such services or 
very inadequate child protection services. And in the last couple of years, WHO has developed a, a guideline for the role that frontline health professionals, such as nurses or nurse assistants working in clinics, um, can play to identify and provide very basic care or first aid when you see child maltreatment occurring. They, of course, will not be able to do any big time interventions such as cognitive behavior therapy, but they may be able to provide an opportunity for that family, for that child to kind of start exploring a way out of the problem. Um, I believe that similar things may be done with teachers and with other adult authority figures in settings where children may encounter them. However, I can speak really only about what we are trying to do for health sector, for, for health sector professionals, because of course, yeah. children inevitably come to nurses for their checkups, for their road to health checkups and so forth. And it's at these occasions, the child or the adult may not disclose anything about abuse, but a health, sec a health provider might notice a suspicious bruise or a pattern of behavior, which says that is a signature of this child being abused. And then they can be there to, to provide an opportunity for that to be opened up to some kind of deeper assistance. Uh, thanks, Alec. Um, there's a question from Takutsua uh, Chirindo. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, is there an international law uh, which protects the rights of uh, women and children against violence? Um, sure. I mean, for, for children, there's the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and there is the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Both of these are international human rights instruments, which countries are encouraged to use and to domesticate, sorry, domesticate the codes in those, those instruments by putting them into their laws. However, there is no um, international law that can force any particular country to implement a particular set of laws. Therefore, we have to work in order to encourage countries by showing them the positive benefits of enacting such laws and enforcing them, because we do not have any law which can be, through some kind of international mechanism, forced onto countries. Thanks, Alex. Um, I know you talk about this uh, at the beginning, but we still get some questions about um, what is the what is this uh, what is the impact of um, violence uh, experienced during childhood, uh, the, the long term, the short term. Uh, can, maybe you can repeat for our audience who just joined. Okay, I'll be glad to do so. Um, the impact of violence can be broken down into, as Sari said, immediate short-term impacts, medium-term impacts, and longer-term impacts. In the short term, some forms of violence against children lead to physical injuries such as brain damage, fractures, bruises, and so forth. Of those physical injuries, some will lead to those children having disabilities, and a very small number will lead to those children dying. And we know that each year in children aged 0 to 17, there are 40,000 homicides. However, far beyond all of these, far beyond the homicides, violence against children serves to act like a bit of a time bomb. So a child who's exposed to violence, say between two and five years of age, may then, by the time they become 12 or 15 years old, start to manifest a whole set of increased risky behaviors, as we call them, such as smoking, using alcohol, using illicit drugs, engaging in unsafe sexual behaviors, such as multiple sexual partners, um, and having psychiatric and problems such as suicidal tendencies, depression, or anxiety. 
these problems in turn often lead such individuals to try and what we say in some circles self-medicate by further abusing more and more substances, using more nicotine, engaging in more obsessive or addictive behaviors. And then in the long run, by the time they are adults in middle age, then they start to develop increased likelihood of cancers, cardiovascular disorders, and for instance, um, liver, liver disease as a result of their behaviors. So really the consequences are spread across the lifespan, and when you add them all together, cost a, a huge amount. I mean, in the USA, for instance, I'm just looking here, uh, the cost of child maltreatment in one year in the US is um, estimated to be $228 billion when you add together all of those life force consequences. And that's about the same as the cost of stroke in the USA. In South Africa, um, they estimated that in one year, violence against children and all these consequences I've listed um, cost the equivalent of about 4.3% of that country's gross domestic product. And I think in Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific as a region, we were looking at something like about 2.3% of the region's um, gross domestic product when you put together all of these consequences across the lifespan. So it the consequences are many, and they are costly. Wow. Um, yeah, the impact is is really uh, broad. I mean, when we think about it, you know, I think uh, everyone should should think more about this violence against children because the impact is is really broad. Um, one last question is about emotional violence, Alex. Uh, we haven't really talked about it, but uh, what is the impact? Because it's not really something that you can easily see uh, and how we can stop that. Well, emotional violence is very much part and parcel of, of the kinds of violence that children are subject to and which prevention programs address. It includes things such as belittling, name calling uh, children, um, shunning them, ignoring them, uh, shouting at them, and its consequences alone are often very difficult to specify because it so frequently occurs together with physical violence and with sexual violence. How they would be addressed is in the same way as we would address, for instance, positive parenting, helping parents to understand that these behaviors are harmful, that um, words can hurt, that words can damage people, and that emotional violence, even though it's invisible, has very tangible impacts. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, so for our viewers, uh, like what Alex said, we have some tips about healthy parenting. Uh, please go to our website, uh, www.who.int. It's under the COVID-19 and you can find uh, healthy parenting. Um, so with that, uh, we have many viewers today from around the world. Uh, some, some of them are India, USA, Australia, Uganda, Pakistan, South Africa, Malaysia, Nigeria, Kenya, Morocco, Indonesia, South Sudan, Singapore, Haiti, Tanzania, Zambia, Angola, Cambodia, Ethiopia, uh, UK, UAE, Vietnam, Nepal, Myanmar, Sudan, Brazil, Bangladesh, uh, Sierra Leone, Canada, and Italy, and many more. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today, and hopefully uh, all of us learn more about healthy parenting and uh, the danger of uh, violence against children. Uh, thank you again for watching us today. Uh, live with WHO expert uh, Alex Butchart. And thank you, Alex, for joining us, for sharing uh, your knowledge uh, today. Uh, and again, for more information, please uh, visit uh, uh, our website, www.who.int. Uh, I'm your host, Sari Sikiyogi. Um, please stay healthy and safe. Uh, until next time, bye-bye.